The podcast for the inquisitive diver. Hey there, dive buddies, and welcome to season three. We've had a well deserved break and now ready to get back talking all things aquatic. Now, safety is most definitely the top priority in our sport, and some of you may remember way back in season one, we had the godfather of human factors himself, Gareth Locke. If you've not checked it out, you can go back after you've met this next guest. This guy is pretty fly. In fact, he actually teaches the wannabe Tom Cruise top guns of the Aussie Air Force how to do their job. Mike Mason is one of the Human Factors team and is launching into providing the various educational programs to all and any that want to learn. Mike, welcome to the show, buddy. How was flying today? Did buzz any towers? Thanks very much, Matt. Nice to be here. Uh, today was quite relaxed, actually. I, I went down the bombing range yesterday. I'm going down the bombing range again tomorrow, but today was um, was much more much more relaxed, <laughs> which was nice. Good, good, good. Uh, welcome to the show, mate. Welcome to the show. Um, Thank you. I good think to be um, I think before we delve into the human factor side of things, uh, we should uh, we should introduce you to the world and uh, what we're on about with you and your your flying. What's your background? Okay. Uh, I joined the Royal Air Force back in the UK in the year 2000, and I served for 20 years in the RAF, mostly on frontline squadrons, um, flying fighters, and I left uh, in August 2020 um, after, like I say, 20 years as the sort of second in command of um, uh, frontline fighter squadron, which was good fun. And during my whole time in the RAF, I did. Uh, I was an instructor. I, I served on operations. I was quite an experienced supervisor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, during my time in the RAF, I spent three years on an exchange program um, flying with the Australian Air Force, which was between 2014 and 2017. So I spent three years in Australia here, um, just near where I live. Uh, And that's where I met my now fiance, Amanda. So once my time in the RAF was up, I came back over here and the Australian Air Force gave me a job. Uh, And I now teach, as you say, teach the Australian Air Force um, new new guys to um, use an airplane as a weapons platform. So when they come to me, they're already fully qualified pilots. They know how to fly airplanes. But um, uh, my squadron, with you know me and the other instructors and so on, we will take those pilots and actually take them uh, to use the aircraft as a, as a weapons platform. So we teach them tactics, both you know air to air stuff, air to surface stuff, uh, such that when they leave us, they then go and fly the Australian um, Air Force's frontline uh, aircraft. So it's pretty good fun, and uh, and I quite like doing that. And I've been so been flying well been in the air force and the military for like 22 years now which basically means i've been doing human factors type things in my professional life for most of that time and it's it, i've i've largely grown up with it in my adult life um <clears throat> in terms of diving so i first learned to dive uh, back in the late 90s actually in 1999 out in the caribbean and then didn't do it again for quite a while. I uh, had other priorities in life, but got back into it when I was here in Australia, actually, uh, in about 2015, because uh, one of my friends had done some local dives with the Grey Nurse Sharks, showed me some pictures, and I thought, wow, I want to have a go at that. So I got back into the diving in quite a big way. Um, and then when I moved back to the UK in 2017, I again grabbed it with both hands, joined the local dive club up in North Scotland, which I appreciate is an acquired taste for a lot of people, but good visibility, lots of shipwrecks, loads of fish. So loads of diving up there. Um, that was affiliated with BSAC, so got a, ended up being a BSAC dive leader, uh, which I quite enjoyed doing lots of things with them. And then when I moved back to Australia, uh, as well as being in the Air Force, I've um, become a paddy dive master as well. Um, so I now do that casually, do a lot of diving on my own. I use a rebreather as well uh, occasionally. Um, yeah, and I really enjoy my diving as well as, um, as well my professional life of flying. And I think when I got into into diving in a, in a slightly bigger way, maybe about three, three, three a bit years ago, I kind of realised there was quite a big gap between the what I see as the human factors um, benchmark, I suppose, is, is what aviation demonstrates, and how much diving can actually take from um, from the world of flying. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do with my work with the human diver is bring all that all that um, all those years of experience that I've got through the RAF, through flying, and try and um, improve the world of uh, of diving with all those sort of messages. Yeah, and that's that's the relevant pickup there is that um, I mean you're effectively in the same career path as Gareth was as well because he was a navigator, wasn't he? Um, yeah, so that's right. Yeah, he was on C one thirties. I think he joined the Air Force about ten years ahead of me, so he's kind of like ten years yeah, further down his career path, as it were. But um, yeah, we come yeah. from very similar backgrounds. <laughs> Um, yeah, and uh, I mean, I'm ex Air Force myself, but the the methodology methodology of what you do in in the cockpit at the front end, it's all following step by step procedures, isn't it? 
Very much so. It's uh, there's, We have lots of standard operating procedures. We obviously live and breathe checklists and so on and so forth. Um, so, yeah, it is very methodical. It is step by step. There are situations that you have to um, think outside the box to a certain extent, but at the vast... Uh, it's certainly a huge amount of what we do is yeah largely procedurally driven, very methodical, very sort of habit habit driven to um to make sure that things um stay on the rails and that fly the flying that we yeah. do is kept quite safe. And is it fair to say that I mean there's a multitude of training that you do, I'm sure, but is it fair to say that you also um, train um, for uh, every event eventuality or almost all eventualities possible, like you know emergency situations, etc. We train for I suppose whatever. Uh, you give people as much knowledge as they can. So yes, we go in the flight simulator um, quite regularly to practice for emergency scenarios um, where they throw, you know, fire warnings at you, hydraulic problems, electrical problems, and then you therefore get to see, you know, the real the real symbology happening in the airplane, such that you can get trained to deal with it. You're never going to be able to deal with everything because, you know, every so often we'll have. Um, a problem happen where the aircraft just does something weird that's never been seen before. It's, it's, it's incredibly rare, thank God. But the idea is that the idea is that you've got enough skills um, in your toolbox such that when you see something that's a bit off piste, a bit abnormal, you've got enough knowledge and experience to be able to go, well, let's try this. Yes, that's working and achieve a, um, a safe outcome. So we get trained very heavily in things that um, – uh, perhaps are likely to go wrong or known to go wrong, but by having all those things in your toolbox, you can be better prepared when things that things go wrong that perhaps are a bit unusual or um, not quite yeah, as, as, yeah. as common. And um, I mean, I, I'm a huge advocate of practice, 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 and just make everything second nature. So I hope those people who are listening just to that those first few minutes alone can understand how your line of work can cross over into. Um, aiding people in scuba diving to be much safer at the spot that they're trying to enjoy. Definitely. I totally agree. Um, flying is very much something that you uh, you have to keep doing to be good at. And I mean, to take an example, uh, so I went down I went down the bombing range for the first time in maybe only about two or three months the other day, but the first few um, attacks were actually quite poor just because I hadn't done it for so long. By the time I finished the sortie, they were a lot better. But that just goes to show that even, you know, with my relatively high levels of experience fine airplanes if you're not current in something then you will get skill fade and it, you will struggle to um uh, to be able to produce the goods straight away and diving is very much like that you know any um skills and drills shutdown drills on a twin set for example if you don't practice those routinely or bailout drills on a rebreather um putting up a dsmb on a recreational diving etc etc if you don't practice those skills often you will get skill fade and that could be uh, that could exacerbate things when things start to go wrong so yeah, it's practice, practice, practice is uh, is really important. Totally so what's different. I'd like to know um, what um, what it's like um, on the debriefing side of things as well, because obviously human factors a huge proportion of it is um, being aware of of situations and scenarios that that could have actually been a bit of a, a hazard, but um, like like we see many occasions in the forums and the dive forums is that people just don't speak up. Is it much the same within uh, the flying scenario or is it, you know, a behind closed doors kind of chat or is there an open forum nowadays? In general for just about anything that's um, just about any sort of routine, I suppose, mishap, it's all, it's all kind of open doors and every sortie we come back from, we will debrief. You will go and have a, um, uh, and that's not if it's me debriefing a student after a flight. Yes, we'll have a debrief. If it's me doing a flight with other instructors where we're retraining for some skills we haven't done for a while, then we'll debrief each other. And it's certainly very um, a very open, uh, honest culture. The concept being that if we're all, it's all to do with like accountability. I and mean, we have all these standards that I talked about and these methodologies and checklists and stuff. But because there is so much information to to digest and to uh, and to have in your brain, it's you know it's impossible to know it all all of the time. So if you're you go and do the sortie and um, let's say a radio call is done in the wrong place or some a formation change is done um, incorrectly for whatever reason, then afterwards we'll debrief it and say, I think that's how it's supposed to be done. And it'll be like, and but then the person who is being, let's call it corrected or criticized will say, yep, thanks very much. That's corrected my understanding. Um, totally happy. Uh, I'll, I'll take it on board and move forward. So I think that's a big difference. Like the flying culture is, it, it's, and, I, and I, well, let's go into that word culture a bit because it's, because the culture of, of the military aviation world has been evolved for you know decades, really, 
right from the first day of flying training, you're used to having a debrief and you're used to people telling you what you did wrong and how you can fix it. And then as you become the person, if you like, in charge, you can tell other people what they did wrong and how to fix it. And then you tell each other what, what each other did wrong and how to fix it. And so that culture is just embedded. And when you get to the stage I'm at, it's completely normal and everyone's completely uh, open to it and used to it. And it's just, it's it's the done thing. It's it's the cultural norm. And I think in diving, you, you probably agree, debriefing is is not the norm. Um, it, it does happen, but it's certainly not the norm, especially in, you know, recreational fun dive levels. Instructional dives, yes, fair enough. You'll obviously debrief students on their technical skills and things. But I think if you go and have a fun dive with, you know, some mates just off the shore in Port Stephens, like I do here, it's generally a case of everybody gets out and says, right, brilliant, everyone happy? Good off you go and there's no there's never any discussion about anything and um i've had it a couple of times where i've witnessed other divers having their their fins in the coral um because they've, they've just got a quite sort of poor trim and and it really takes a bit of courage to be able to say hey mate just so you know i, I, I saw your fins in the coral i think you want to try and have a um a slightly better trim position just to avoid damage and stuff and most people are quite receptive to that kind of criticism but when i say criticism let's feedback is a better word criticism is not the right word most people are receptive to that kind of um that kind of feedback but it's the culture is not there so it's definitely abnormal um and it can make people feel uncomfortable both the person giving feedback and the person receiving feedback because it's not the cultural norm in diving and um that's part of what the human diver is all about trying to just develop people in, in thinking about uh, these kind of things such that we can improve the culture and make debriefing and make feedback more normal yeah. so that we can all improve well, that's the thing just being able to talk to people but it's it's having that bravery to say you know even to a stranger the, the, the dive sites around sydney they're probably as much the same up your way they, they do get very busy at times and just having that bravery in the car back so oh, by the way did you know your smb was dragging over that you know they might not even know it was occurring and, and actually be thankful or grateful Oh, yeah. And that's the thing people often don't know because we're diving just by the fact you've got, you know, a mask on, relatively poor hearing. It's difficult to have complete essay of what's going on. You are often looking down, drinking straws. You get distracted by a fish, get distracted by what some other, somebody else is doing, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, it's important to have um, to have that feedback. But it's, yeah, it's not the cultural norm. Okay. So um, how, how have you got to this point with um, the – human diver what kind of what's the the, the the line that you've taken with the training that you've had with gareth etc i uh, came across the human diver like i said i think about three years ago now maybe slightly longer um i can't remember if it was by facebook or whatever but i came across the human diver and i thought wow this is brilliant this is all this this stuff really relates to me i could understand i could understand a lot of the concepts because of my aviation background um so i emailed gareth and i just said hello this is me and i think i wrote him like an essay of all the things that i thought were wrong with various bits and bobs and it, it took a while yeah. to get a reply from him <laughs> but in the end in the end we, we built a bit of a rapport uh, I said I would like to get involved and uh, look at being an instructor for the human diver, and he said, "Yep, sure, come on board. This is the course. This is um, this is what it's all about." So I, I just grabbed it with both hands, and that was in uh, probably about eighteen months ago now, maybe nineteen, twenty months ago. Um, started doing the course, and that involved uh, maybe two or three months, um, one session a week, sort of a couple of hours at a time, just online webinar with with him, with the rest of the course that I was with. Um, where we he delivered us the material to quite an, an, a sort of a serious level uh, of, uh, of knowledge, we would then go away, revise the material, pick up um, all the points that we could, do some homework based on it, and then beyond that, we were then uh, the next stage of the process was where we would get the brief the briefings that were prepared by the human diver to deliver to you know other divers as it were, and we then had to essentially give those back to. Um, our peer instructors just as a sort of a practice session to show we understood the concepts um and then beyond that the next stage which to be fair has been delayed very heavily by covid is where we actually do face-to-face -face training so the human diver offers various levels of training and the the top one which we call <clears throat> excuse me level two are these face-to-face -face classes where you have up to six students and it's very immersive lots of interactive um uh, lessons, discussions, there's, there's some computer software programs that get people working as teams. And the idea is that we get together for several of those where uh, I would, I will observe those, then I'll get involved in them, then I will start giving those with, if you like, Gareth monitoring them, and then I'm kind of left um, 
uh, or then I'm, if you like, fully qualified. That was supposed to happen about <laughs> this time last year. COVID's obviously ruined that. But Gareth is, is coming to Australia uh, this winter, um, so I will get fully ticked up then, and uh-huh. that'll be me good to go. In the meantime, I've done um, a few webinars, writing a few blogs, um, just to try and get my name out there, and just trying to get, get just encourage thought amongst the general yeah, diving population yeah. about what human factors in diving is uh, is all about. And what yeah, it's good, good way forward. I mean, um, the the reach of the human diver is clearly going to be a lot uh, a lot more in the UK and throughout Europe than what it is down here. It seems more prominent over there. I might be wrong. Um, but maybe it's because Gareth's in the no, UK think- and, you know, the, the successful book launch. But uh, we're a long way from there, aren't yeah. we? Uh- <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's uh, outside our mind, yeah. maybe, maybe part of it. But uh, no, it's, it's definitely far more prevalent in the um, – uh, in the UK, arguably that's just because where the origins yeah. of the human diver are, or, or were, depending on the point of view. But um, I'm hoping to, you know, g- get a bit of a footprint with it all in Australia and take it forward and help people yeah. learn in this country yeah. as well. So let's let's have a look at some of the benefits then. Um, for let's let's start with the dive pros, DMs, and instructors. What are the benefits for them to do the human diver courses? Well, let's take a, a dive master as a good uh, as a good start. So I, I work as a dive master, and I try and embrace, I try and take my human diver um, or human factors rather concepts into the um, uh, the dive master world. If you've got an awareness of human factors, it just allows you to take a more um, a more considered, a more ma- a more real, a, a more mature, I suppose, modern look at, at the way that systems work. So. Your basic dive master, um, or if you like, you know, your standard dive master training um, from, you know, Paddy, Raid, SSI, whatever, you, you do your course and then you're, you've basically said, right, here you go, you're qualified, have a job, go and be a dive master, look after these divers and off you go. But you're not really taught any, there's nothing formal in any of the dive master training material to do with how you actually work well as a team. And there's nothing to do with sort of formal leadership skills, there's nothing to do with um, effective communication skills. You are your briefing is kind of monitored, but there's nothing to do with debriefing, which is um, you know something which I think is quite important. So if you've got that human factors um, training, you you can learn about how to be not how to be an expert leader. It's not going to make you the greatest leader in the world, but it will give you some ideas about how you can lead a team and how you can build a team quite quickly. How you can um, uh, just get people involved and feel comfortable and safe talking to you if they've got any concerns. You know, you, you're as a dive master, you might have somebody who's a complete novice or somebody who perhaps hasn't dived for a couple of years, and all of a sudden you're throwing them off off a boat into water they can't see the bottom of, and they know and there's a, a bit of swell around and they might be quite nervous. But with some of the human factors training, you can really um, help mitigate against some of those issues with with novice divers um, just by, as I say, some of the leadership, teamwork, communication skills that we can talk about. As I, I've, I mentioned debriefing, I'll probably mention this again a few times, I'm sure, during this talk. But, it, you know, the norm is not generally for dive masters to have a debrief um, because it's not really part of the job description, I suppose. It was well, there's, a, there's, a, part there's of a bit. The, it, there is a bit. It's just not as – it's not like as formal as, you know, you would expect it. You know, to sit down and have a, a coffee and talk about the dive and, and talk about what was seen and where they went. Maybe not into the detail of any kind – you know, picking up on any kind of major issues. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. And I think um, and I think that's kind of what I like to do as a dive master as well is um, at the end of a, at the start of a dive or the start of the day, I'll ask people, I'll say to people that I'd mm-hmm. like some feedback at the end. So if you have things you do like, then great. Things you don't like, then please tell me and so on and so forth. And when we, uh, yeah, when we've done a dive, um, I'll, you know, ha- hopefully have written a few wet notes and I'll say, right, well, how's, how's everybody feeling? Everybody have a good time. If people didn't get th- if people got through their air quite quickly you know we might talk about how they could improve that sort of thing if people have um yeah uh, a quite an upright trim position again i might well give them some advice on how they can improve that and i'll certainly ask people to debrief me as well because i'm i'm certainly not the most experienced diver in the world certainly not the most mm. experienced dive master in the world and and i want to improve so I, I ask people if there's things that i can do better and occasionally people will um come up with things and say actually i thought we could have done more of this or or, or less of that and it's like okay thanks and, and I, I try and take that forward to, to improve my dive mastering okay and i suppose as um as individuals so the other side of the fence so the recreational divers that are going with the the, the dive guides if they're um more aware on the human factor front then maybe they'd be more empathetic to the dive leader who might actually be a little bit you know 
uh, nervous when it comes to giving feedback that might be a little bit awkward, like you're crap at trim. Yeah, it, it works both ways. And that's something that we talk about quite a lot in the um, the teamwork and the uh, what we call leadership and followership module, where it's it's very much a two-way relationship. And while you might have a dive master who is technically in charge, he, you are you, he's still the more you can do to support that dive master as a diver within a team then the higher the chances of um well a a safer outcome of the dive in general but also the higher the chances of just of just having a good dive you know just being able to make sure that things happen quick smoothly and efficiently so everybody has a good time and everybody gets the most out of it it's not it's not all about safety a lot of it is a lot of it is actually about just getting the most out of the situation with the team that you've got. And if you're working well as a team member, then you can, um, which as I say, those skills can be developed by human factors training, then you can really help the dive master and the whole team achieve, um, just get more out of their diving, more out of what they're doing. Well, what what about the people? I mean, mean, you've got quite a job ahead of yourself, I've got to say. Um, You know, you're taking on Australia on human factors and Aussies are laid back, livable people that are like, yeah, yeah. We get it done. It's all right. Yeah, be right. Yeah, no. be right. <laughs> um, <laughs> how how are you going to get the people on side that are going to be like, well, I've been taught how to dive, so you can't teach me anymore. This it's not really about teaching people to how to dive, and that's. I mean, I, I have no. I'm not a diving instructor. I mm-hmm. teach people how to fly airplanes, um, which is fine, but it's certainly not teaching people how to um, how to dive. So it's not really about. Um, making people better at their technical diving ability. It's about making them better as uh, team divers, working working with other divers and how they interact together to get more out of, out of a diving situation. So in terms of winning those people over, as it were, I mean, I'm not, there's no point in me trying to shove it down people's throats. There's no point in me trying to say, do you know what, Mr. Um, you know, Mr. Smith with 5,000 dives, that's brilliant, but you actually have no idea what you're talking about because I'm my <laughs> human factors expert. There's no way I'm going to win that argument. I'm, I'm yeah. completely wasting my time. But all I, all I want to try and do is just, and, and again, there's no real point in going in with a direct approach along the lines of, right, well, actually, you need to think about this from a human factors point of view because otherwise you're just, you're not going to get any better. You, you often need to kind of, shape things specifically like um and the, the, the a, a good example or an easy one to um get across is, is the feedback that we've talked about already like if somebody is uh, let's say somebody does have bad trim and you can and if you go to that person and say mate your trim is crap they will instantly get the hackles up and say well who are you yeah. to tell me about my trim whereas if you can be a bit more uh if you can make it about the behavior rather than about the person, you're much more likely to actually build some, build a decent relationship. So if somebody, let's say somebody does have bad trim and you could say, mate, I noticed your trim in the water was a little bit, um, was a little bit upright. You might find that you get more, um, you get more out of a tank of, out of a tank of gas that you disturb the bottom less if you try swimming like this. So maybe think about tank positioning or where, you, where your weights are, maybe your weight belt's sitting too low or, or, or something like that. So actually make it about the behavior rather than about them. If you, if you instantly jump in with you're the problem, then people will get their hackles up and they won't respond to that feedback. And that's kind of a subtle, that's that's a, one example of a communication skill that we talk about within the human diver um, training to try and just help get that message across. A lot of it is about the way, it's not necessarily what you say to people, it's the way you say that to um, to people to try and get the message across, which really can you know, make the difference between whether that feedback feedback is um, well received or not, and then building up a rapport with yeah, uh, with that individual. Yeah. No, it's very true. I mean, it's a sport that you know. I'm a massive advocate of, of communication. I think it's it's key in almost everything that we do, and even more so when we're diving. Yeah, well, that, that's it. It all adds up. There's this. There's no, I wouldn't say there's no real negatives, but if you if you can embrace it for what it what it is, what it's trying to what it's trying to achieve, then then yeah everybody just gets more out of their dive you're likely to keep it safer which is if you like the the general and the general acceptance of what human factors training is all about but actually you'll just you'll just get more out of the dive as a team if you're all communicating effectively if you have a little brief and you just say right well rather than the person who's the assumed leader saying okay everyone here we go follow me it's like right how much gas has everyone got you've got slightly less okay well let's just be aware of that um what does everybody want to do today? Oh, you want to try and find that nudibranch that you've never seen before. Okay, well, everybody keep a lookout for that. And that way you can just you can just focus what people are trying to do by just having a little five minute chat beforehand. And then afterwards you can talk you can talk about it in a debrief. And just those communication skills, you know, before and after the dive, um, really can improve the 
the the overall situation, the whole outcome, and everybody just gets more out of their diving by having those better communication yeah. skills. And that was because you mentioned that you work in like part time, free time, whatever it is. Um, where where is it? Which dive shop? Nelson Bay, isn't it? Yes, I work for Let's Go Adventures in uh, Nelson yeah. Bay in Port Stevens. And how, how's it been received there? Um, did you have a, a, a bit of a, a bump at the start, a bit of a brick wall at the start at all? Well, so far with the shop, I mean, I think Let's Go Adventures is, um, I suppose, a relatively hmm. typical dive shop in the current day and age. The the, the staff, the, the permanent staff there are quite busy. COVID has had a massive impact um as you can expect so they're constantly rushing around with their heads on fire quite a lot trying to sort out all the problems in the shop but generally how i try and approach it uh, rather than sort of rocking up as this you know relatively inexperienced dive master and saying to mick the shop manager hey mick just so you know i know you've been diving for 30 years but actually you're doing it all wrong there's just no there's no point in that because i'm yeah. never going to get anywhere and mick is a, is a very competent experienced instructor yeah. um instructor and diver but what i try and do when i go and do the um uh, the guided dives on either, either with, whether it be shore dives or on the boat, I will, uh, you know, when I'm giving the brief, if there's other sort of people, other members of staff watching, I'll I'll talk to them afterwards and say, what did you think of that brief? Did you know? Did you think it was good? Did you think it was bad? Do you think there's things I need to improve? And um, I'm just trying to sort of slowly drip feed some of the ideas, almost by osmosis, rather than saying, oh, by the way human factors we should be doing human factors better i just try and do it through what i think is demonstrating good behavior and good specific practices and with the hope that other people go well that's a good idea yeah mike's got some good way of doing business let's you know let's take it forward and improve as a shop hey guys and girls i hope you're enjoying the show i just wanted to take 30 seconds of your time to give a huge shout out to a man who has breathed life back into my diving now let me explain that one i'm getting a little bit older gray in the beard blurry in the eyesight and it's the latter that's been frustrating part, especially for underwater photography. Cue the hero of the day, Rob Hamilton. Now, he's an optician located in DY and the founder of Ozbob Scuba, who specializes in prescription masks. He has a wide range of masks available, various lens types to configure to your specific needs, and the skills and experience to add the adjustments to account for water refraction. Now, I tell you, it's the best money I've spent in years. So if you need a prescription mask, head on over to see Rob or check him out online at ozbobscuba.com and say a quick hi from Scuba Goat 2. Now back to the show. Right. So there's a webinar course in Australia uh, starting next Wednesday. So that's my first um, That's my first course that I'm going to run. Um, as I say, starting Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Sydney time. Uh, links to that on the Human Diver from Australia um, or the Human Diver, various links around the internet for that kind of thing. And then um, the face-to-face -face courses well, there's going to be about six, I think, being run in Australia uh, starting in July all the way through into August. And again, you can find details on those on thehumandiver.com. Um, and then from there, I will take the reins, as it were. And every future course in this part of the world, Australia, Asia Pacific, uh, will be hopefully run by okay. yours truly. So that's the uh, that's the idea. Yep. Webinar starting next week. Face-to-face -face classes starting middle of the year. And okay. then I'll take it on. So Gareth's coming across to do the face-to-face the -face bits and, and work with you to to hand over the reins exactly that. okay yes right so uh sometime at probably end of next week i'm going to put a link out on uh, on my facebook uh, human diver from australia page my intention is to try and to try and sow the seed for what uh, human factors is all about in the world of diving i'm going to do a, a 20 minute zoom chat which anybody can obviously sign up to um just access the link and there'll be questions at the end. Um, and the idea is that people can just come along completely for free and I'll just give a 20 minute chat about what human factors is or are all about, how they fit into the world of diving. And, and I'll go into a bit more specifics about, you know, different types of divers and what they can actually expect from it. So in one of the problems, one of the criticisms that's been leveled at Human Diver in the past is that it often gets quite academic and into sort of quite serious high-end academia type concepts and mm. people just lose interest because most people just want to go diving, right? Nobody cares about the theory of, or perhaps nobody cares. A lot of people don't care about the theory of learning, the theory of teaching. So when those concepts kind of crop up and there are links posted to it, people just go, oh, I'm just not interested yeah. anymore. I just want to go diving. So what I'm hoping to do more with this soundbite webinar um, is just come up with some specific examples for specific types of divers. So if you're a, a recreational diver, then um, 
things that you want to sort of know about is how what you need to do or what you can do as a sort of junior novice diver to kind of help the instructor out Um, and that comes back to those communication skills those kind of awareness things um and if you're the instructor at the other end, again, how you can encourage your students to, to speak up when they're not comfortable with something. Because, again, that's a lot of that comes comes from a, a leadership point of view, from an instructional point of view. But those skills aren't necessarily taught, like I say, formally in, in instructional classes. Uh, a lot of it's more focused on the technical skills and things like that. If you're a... Um, uh, if you're a dive master, we've talked about that sort of thing already, but communication skills, how you're going to um, – things you can put into the brief, engaging your audience a bit more. I often find that dive master briefs are normally quite good. They've normally got all the information there that you want, but they're very one way. There's not much getting information back from the audience. So what I will always try and do is ask my divers um, – Right. If I say, if I give you the signal for how much how much gas have you got, um, what are you going to give back to me? Because you get a, a big variety of answers, and it's important to try and sort all that out before the yeah. dive before you get in the water. So that's the kind of that's about two way communication. So that's something that dive masters can get out of it. Um, if you're a a boat skipper, you know what sort of things do, do can you get out of that? And, and a lot of it, boat skippers are often kind of a bit sort of stand back and don't want to get involved. But if you can build up um, a bit of a rapport with with the people that are on your boat and just encourage some discipline, um, some checks, some habit patterns, and, and some cultural norms that again all com- all come under human factors, then you can do uh, just do more as a skipper to again ensure safety, but also ensure that people will get more out mm-hmm. of out of their diving. If you're if you're a dive shop owner, there's plenty of things you can do there as well. If you've got you know junior young dive masters or instructors working for you, it's important that you build the the culture that they can speak up and contribute to make the company a better place to work and a better place to function. You don't want to be that boss that just kind of constantly berates your staff for being idiots because they're never going to tell you when things aren't going well because mm. they know you won't want to hear it. And as soon as, as soon as they can, they're just going to leave and do something else. So you know lots of human factors things for um for dive shop owners. Uh, uh, as well it's, it's it's the whole spectrum of um of the dive industry as it were um right from you know agency manager all the way through to brand new recreational diver there's something in there for everyone so this soundbite webinar i'm just going to try i'm just going to look at each individual uh, each several individual um examples of a typical person in the in across the, the spectrum of divers and just some specific examples uh within that of how human factors can improve uh, what you get out of your diving with a view to trying to get people to think oh yeah okay that actually mm, can have something mm. for me it's often it's quite common that when I try and sell um, human factors to divers, they'll they'll look at it and they'll almost look for an excuse that it doesn't apply to them. So I, I posted a, a link out for the for the webinar series um, to a few, you know Facebook people a few weeks ago, and one of the guys got back to me and said, "Yeah, I don't think this is relevant to me. I'm only a recreational diver. I don't do this technical stuff." And it's like, oh, okay. And I you know I replied back to him and said. I, I agree that on face value, it's probably more applicable to technical diving, rebreather diving, that kind of thing. But there are definitely a huge number of lessons you can get out of um, or a huge um, uh, wealth of knowledge and experience you can get out of human factors training as a recreational I actually, diver. Whenever I go, whenever I do my dive master and stuff, I, I come back with, a, with a one or two new case studies every time. <laughs> I, I've got to interject there because I, I, I think it's the opposite. I think technical divers, cave divers, rebreathers, all that kind of stuff, I think they have actively stepped into the environment where procedures are key. And I've not met many tech divers that don't actually follow procedures, whether they're getting kitted up, getting in the water, or doing the dive. However, recreational divers, they go to Thailand on the piss. They have three days they get taught by someone who's been on the piss with them on how to do open water diving. And then the next time they go diving, again, is on holiday where someone puts all the equipment together for them, helps them splash around in the water for a bit just because they want a bigger tip. Um, and they forget about the, the basic skills. So I think, it's, I think it's more relevant to recreational divers than what it is technical divers personally. Okay. Um, I think there's probably a mix there. Have you? I don't know if you've seen it, but the um – Technical divers are definitely taught to follow procedures um, with everything they're doing, you know, re- rebreather assembly, pre-dive checks, et cetera, et cetera. I totally agree. They're all taught to do that. But one of the things that it's important to be aware of is that the the real world, the, the diving systems that we find ourselves in, 
don't necessarily know about those procedures. So, for example, I mean, the best case study I've got for you is probably the, uh, have you seen the video, If Only, that's, um, that Gareth yeah. produced a couple of years ago? You know, there you go. You've got a, a team of, you know, rebreather divers going and doing a deep rebreather course, but just due to several little things adding up, the procedures weren't followed exactly because distraction got in place, other other factors played in, and ultimately somebody died. So um, uh, while the technical divers are certainly taught to, and most of the time do follow those procedures, little things just get in the way. And um, uh, there's there's always going to be that element of of little bits, you know, and little scenarios, and it's this, you know, what if this, what if that. Yep. But me personally, having worked in the recreational industry in several countries now, mm. I think it's it's more relevant there. For, for if you were to put it under a generic umbrella of who needs human factors more, um, a very good example will be conducting over a thousand dives in Papua New Guinea. Yep, and the customers that came to the resort, I would always get them new customers. You're always going to get your, your kit on the deck before you get on the boat and you're going to set it up and you're going to do your pre dive checks. Then we know what base level we're working with. And the amount of, um, oh, majority of the time people were okay, but I had more stubborn people in, in that environment than anywhere else that I've done any kind of diving because they, you know, I think it was the embarrassment of knowing that they couldn't remember how to put the equipment together, let alone check it. They're just used to someone else doing it for them. Yeah, and that's a big part of it. The, the cultural, the cultural norms that they've been exposed to are they go to a dive shop and the kit's set up for them. That's yeah. that is fine from a customer. Well, sorry, I wouldn't say it's fine. It's potentially beneficial from a customer service point of view because they get great reviews for look how well we were looked after. But yeah, from a from an overall diving safety culture point of view, it's terrible for all the reasons that that we know. It's it's if people mm. don't practice those skills then the skills will fade and they will not be as safe in the water as they could be. So, yeah, I, I agree that recreational divers certainly have – there's a lot for recreation, recreational divers to take out of it. So let's go back to the um, uh, a broad brush definition of human factors. There are if, if you were to Google what human factors are, you can get all sorts of really complicated, again, academic jargon about how it's all to do with the way human beings interact with systems, processes, et cetera, et cetera. And that instantly, unsurprisingly, loses people at the first hurdle quite a lot of the time. The best definition I've found for human factors is they are all about making it easier to do the right thing and harder to do the wrong thing. And if you kind of always go back to that basic principle in whatever you're doing um, as a human being interacting with anything, then that is what human factors are all about, making it easier to do the right thing and harder to do the wrong thing. Yeah. Now, Within the human diver, um, what we tend to focus on within the world of human factors, which is huge because there are just so many aspects of, of, um, of, of, of the subject, the human diver tends to focus on what we call not the non-technical skills. So you've within diving, um, you've got your technical skills, and that doesn't mean tech diving or recreational diving. Technical skills are things like uh, just fitting technique, um, mass clearing drills putting up a dsmb if you're uh, a cave diver then it'd be laying line in a cave if you're um <clears throat> a rebreather diver it'd be doing bailout drills etc cetera, etc cetera. those yeah. are kind of specific technical skills for how you actually do your diving as it were now non-technical skills are things social skills um that are to do with making your making it easier to do your technical skills in in, a, in, in simple jargon. So the non-technical skills that we sort of talk about are it's all about making good decisions, which is fed by having good situation awareness, which is fed by having good communication, which is all fed by having good teamwork and good leadership and so on and so forth. Now, if you've got all those things together with in a good non-technical skills environment, then as a team, you have what's called a good shared mental model. And the idea, the idea of a good shared mental model, or the or the uh, the meaning of it, is that you're all thinking along the same wavelength. You don't necessarily think in exactly the same thing, but you've got a better idea of what's going on, and therefore you're more likely to have a better outcome, whether that's a safer outcome or just a higher performing outcome or whatever. That shared mental model will just improve the output of the team. And the best example of probably not or the probably the simplest example to relate to with non technical skills in um, uh, in, a, in a mature environment would be airline crews. So whenever you have um, a civilian airliner, you've got two pilots up the front and they often won't fly together all the time. They'll just get thrown together um, on, according, in accordance with their crew roster, but they're used to working with SOPs. They're used to working with um, the same checklist. Like they're used to SOPs. doing their jobs together. 
SOP, standard operating procedures. Standard operating procedures. Sorry, there you go. That's, that's <laughs> good military jargon in there. Um, so they're used to doing all these things together, but because they they come together as a crew, so that they can um, and they have they'll have a brief before they go flying. They'll obviously communicate all the time when they are flying, and then afterwards they'll have a debrief to talk about things that potentially you know could have been done better. Um, and the idea of, of of working in that kind of environment is that airline crew has a really solid, robust shared mental model. And that is a very that's evolved, you know. In, in here we are, twenty twenty two, over you know decades. Back in the nineteen seventies, when airliners were crashing relatively often, uh, <laughs> the whole non technical skills training just didn't exist. It was just you know you'd listen to the accident date recorder afterwards, and you're like, oh, those pilots were idiots. But yeah. they probably didn't mean to crash the airplane. So non technical skills has evolved massively in commercial aviation, and that's where I think it really comes into diving just by taking all those all those years of experience in the airline industry or well aviation industry in general um, and trying to shape it into into diving context just so we can get more out of uh, more out of diving and making it safer and and more rewarding and more enjoyable and it, aviation is not the only world that does this you know medicine um, it's it's massively in medicine now nuclear power mining oil and gas there's lots of other industries out there that really take non-technical skills training within human factors you know quite seriously people invest organizations companies spend a lot of money on this stuff because they get more out of their people um it, it's 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 good for business it's it's for lots of reasons and i think diving can can really take a lot from it as well yeah and i think it's fair to say i mean just to um just to you know doffed my cap to to what you're doing and, and what you're going on to do here i think um i think we've got to recognize that you you seem to enjoy um, getting better in uh, performance out of people, helping people. Otherwise, oh, yeah. you wouldn't be doing the job you're doing now, and you wouldn't be looking at doing this um, on the side no, and, and beyond. No, it's um, I, 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 human. When you get really into the human factors side of it, like it's it's fascinating how you almost automatically look at things in a different way. Um, mm. Little things like I was in the kitchen a, a few days ago, and something something was spilled on the floor. And I think once upon a time, I'd have said, oh, who did that? But actually, now you kind of look at it and go, I wonder how that happened. Because, you know, you, mm. you try and look at it from a, a point of view of that probably wasn't deliberate. Therefore, something came together to make that happen in, on, um, inadvertently. Um, whereas I think traditionally, especially in diving, you know, something goes wrong. Social media forums, classic example, people will, you know, jump on other people and say, who did you know who did that what an idiot you know how dare they, they how stupid is that person when in actual yeah. fact it's like they probably didn't mean to be stupid they probably you know didn't come from a um uh, uh, the culture the culture they're used to in diving perhaps wasn't very um proactive in terms of doing buddy checks and therefore they weren't mm -hmm. used to doing those sort of things so all these yeah. little things were more likely to add up to them having an accident and those things yeah. are never, uh, rarely looked at in diving so i think um I, yeah my, my human factor stuff has really made it quite i look at things in quite a different light now which i think is quite healthy <laughs> yeah yeah I, 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 fair play to you as well if you can promote you know better constructive criticism and assistance to people then fair play to you because i'm I don't know about you but i'm i'm sick to the back teeth with facebook armchair warriors that someone will ask an innocent question or pose a, a scenario that they went through looking for advice on how to avoid the same situation occurring again yep and within the first two three comments there's always someone who wants to berate the person and put them down for doing the wrong thing they're not actually yeah. looking for that. They're looking for a system to prevent it yeah. happening again. But yeah, people people want advice. People they want to they want to get better. And so they, as you say, as you say, mm. they put their hand up. They put their head above the parapet. And there are it's a shame. There are plenty of armchair warriors out there that will just shoot them down. Yeah, it's yeah. it's becoming. I think it's probably becoming less so. And I think I think part of that is is perhaps people are just more aware of of human factors and decent feedback skills and so on and so forth. So I think there is. Um, it, the culture is moving on sl slowly, but yeah, there's a lot of uh, old old fashioned attitudes out there which uh, mm. can commit sometimes. <laughs> uh, we'll leave them behind. We'll just we'll just you know continue on with the people that have got empathy and understanding and uh, make everything better. Well, and that's the thing, you know, if you're um, uh, you're you're a, you're a student and you've got um you know you've you've had two instructors in the past and you've got an option to go with one of those instructors again in the future or or a dive company or a dive shop or whatever if you've had 
a good relationship with one of those in the past because they gave you good honest feedback or they listened to the feedback you gave them and you think oh these people they were they they want to listen to me i want to listen to them that relationship will will develop and prosper and go forward whereas the relationship that was perhaps a bit more toxic for whatever reason um will fail and therefore that particular you know dive shop dive company will will not get the repeat business so it's it becomes self once it's embraced for what it is and what it can offer it really can become self-perpetuating and, and everybody wins it's not it's not about um you know somebody doing better than somebody else it's about the whole diving world um winning basically getting more out of it all. yeah everybody wins. yeah and being safe and but yes yeah, safety number, is number the one. um Safety is if, if the uh, the best part of it. I think definitely you're 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 more likely to have um, safer outcomes by just trying to do more with the human factors, non technical skills outside of diving. But it's certainly um, it does go way beyond that. It's it's people will get more fun out of it. People will just um, perform better as a team. You know, we talked about people. If, if you're having if you're happy and you're getting feedback on. Um, on, on perhaps poor trim technique, which is, again, all part of human factors, non-technical skills, then you'll get more out of your dive. And therefore, if you're part of a group and you're the one that always gets through your gas quicker, everybody else gets more out of their dive as well because you can just do more as a team. So it's it's all about improving you know, everybody's diving, not just, not just your own. Okay. Well, I think we'll round it up there. Um, ladies and gents, you've got, uh, you've got Mike uh, giving his uh, time next week for free um on his webinar to go into a bit more detail about human diver so we'll we'll put the link up and michael have it on his facebook page you got instagram as well mike no i just use facebook at the moment okay the yeah. human diver from australia just put that into the search bar and you can find that quite easily cool beans and chuck it on instagram as well mate you know, you're gonna need that right um that's the next yeah. job then <laughs> yeah yeah okay um thanks for coming on the show mate and thanks for opening up season three and I wish you every success here going forward for the human diver in Australia. And um, I believe we might have to have a, another beer when I'm up in Newcastle next time. Sounds good. Look forward to it. My pleasure. Thanks for, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Bye for now. This is Scuba Goat Under the Sea, the podcast for the inquisitive diver. <laughs>